In precisely five days, the first criminal trial of a former American president is set to begin in New York City. And soon after that, a parade of witnesses is expected to take the stand. According to ABC News, several members of Trump's inner circle are expected to testify at his upcoming criminal trial. That list includes Rona Graff, Trump's executive assistant, Madeleine Westerhout, the former director of Trump's Oval Office operations, and Hope Hicks. Trump's former White House senior advisor, who was once considered one of his closest, closest confidants. It is an open question whether or not they will give up the goods on their former boss. But today, Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg appeared to send a strong message to any potential witnesses who may or may not be considering lying for Trump on the witness stand. Alan Weisselberg, the former chief financial officer of the Trump Organization, was sentenced to five months in jail after Bragg's office prosecuted him for lying during his testimony in Trump's recent civil fraud case. Weisselberg is 76 years old, and this is his second stint at Rikers Island Jail. He served three months behind bars just last year for tax fraud. Joining me now is Jeremy Saland, former assistant district attorney in the Manhattan DA's office trial division and also a New York criminal defense attorney. It's great to see you. To see you. So am I, I mean, it sure seems like a message to throw Alan Weisselberg in jail again at 76. I mean, it was already seen as kind of, you know, a tough move to throw him in jail the first time, a second bid right before the criminal trial begins. Do you read it that way? I see it not as a chilling effect that's going to adversely impact these witnesses to say we shouldn't testify, right. but it's going to be more in terms of a reality check that if you make believe and if you tell a story that isn't true and you misrepresent, we as prosecutors are going to do, your, do our homework and hold you accountable. And if we can put Weisselberg, an older gentleman, in custody, yeah. you can find yourself there, too. Yeah, right. I mean, and, and it would suggest come clean or else, or right? Stay home. Or stay home. Or don't come. Don't come at all. I mean, when we talk about the some of the witnesses that I just listed off, I mean, what is your expectation about how forthcoming they will be? Some of these folks have already testified in separate cases or to separate, you know, law enforcement bodies or grand juries. I mean, how, how much of a lift do you think is it going to be to get them to speak the whole truth about what Trump did. I think certainly they're going to see the writing on the wall that they have to be consistent if they testified before in any capacity, because that inconsistency, again, could raise the same issue that Weisselberg ended up having to deal with. Yeah. So I, I would expect if they're going to be put on the stand and cross-examined, they're going to be relatively forthright, relatively being the key word here. Uh, are they going to not recall certain things? Are they going to maybe sway a little bit? That certainly can happen. But if there is a, a, a testimony and there is a history, they're going to stay with that. Otherwise, that exposure can be huge. And they don't want to become the storyline. This is Donald Trump's storyline, not theirs. Yeah. It's also kind of Michael Cohen's storyline, too, right? Which is very true. One of the interesting sort of um, carve-outs, if you will, in this Weisselberg deal for the current Rikers Island sentence is that um, prosecutors agreed they would not call Weisselberg as, uh, to the witness stand during the upcoming tr criminal trial. That is interesting to me because the only person who can really directly refute Michael Cohen's testimony in some of the most kind of high stakes, uh, fraudulent, allegedly fraudulent dealings here is Alan Weisselberg, right? Like if Michael Cohen, if there's a defense witness that could undermine Michael Cohen's uh, testimony, it's probably Alan Weisselberg, isn't it? It is. But I think also Michael Cohen undermines Michael Cohen <laughs> yeah, well. because he is rich with all sorts of material that you can challenge him with, the things that he says, his intent, his motive, his change of story, his own convictions. So there's ample evidence there to challenge him. And, and if you recall, at one point, Trump said, you shouldn't even be able to testify, Michael Cohen, because of your history and what, what you've been found to misrepresent. And that's not how the law works. You can cross-examine him, but you can't preclude him. So you know, I think there's still going to be ample opportunities, but also the prosecution is not putting this solely on Michael Cohen's shoulders. Yeah. It's beyond Michael Cohen. It's not just the Michael Cohen sort of opportunity. It's beyond him. It's more. Well, you can see already from the list of witnesses that we know about that this is not right. just going to be Michael Cohen, though he certainly will figure largely in it. Um, I, it does seem, just reading the tea leaves, which have not been subtle, that Donald Trump does not want this trial to start, right? I think every single day this week, and it's only Wednesday, he has re re filed a request to stay the trial for some different reason each day, and he has been summarily rejected each and every time. How unusual is that? To have Article 78s in this way is unusual. And Article 78 is a... Uh... Is it challenging basically the law's decision, pardon me, the judge's decision saying it's improper, I'm going to go to a higher court, the appellate court, give it to a judge and say, judge, this is arbitrary and capricious, it's not based on the law, based on the fact, it's a mistake. And that's what he's trying to say. And he's going to fail, 
and he's going to fail. And in fact, he has failed. At some point, he has to move forward. The judge is saying this has to go forward. And, you know, I think not, not to minimize or belittle the former president, but I, I, despite his facade and despite his, his boisterous behavior, he's a, he's a frightened little boy. He's really terrified about what potentially could happen to him. And an e-felony is not what's happening in Washington, D.C. or Florida, but it's a felony and it's real. And he sees Weisselberg. And this is a, sort of a day of reckoning that he's trying to avoid. Well, yeah, actually, talk about a chilling message. If you're Donald Trump and seeing Alan Weisselberg go back to jail for perjury about the square footage of Donald Trump's apartment, Absolutely. a bid at Rikers at the age of 76, that has to send a shiver down Donald Trump's spine. Absolutely. All right. Well, perhaps there'll be two more requests in the next coming days. We'd love to talk watch to you. Yeah, watch your <laughs> clock. If it ends in day, Jeremy, thanks for your time tonight. My pleasure. Great to see you. If you are unfamiliar... Fox host Sean Hannity devotes a significant portion of his show each night to attacking President Biden. But recently, another candidate has captured his attention, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. If you are a left-wing voter, Kennedy, frankly, gives you all the nutty Biden, Bernie Sanders, Green New Deal, climate alarmist, religious cult policies, maybe without the corruption and sleaze and the chaos, and he definitely knows what day of the week it is. If you're a left winger, you'll love RFK Jr., according to Sean Hannity. Today we learned that that particular argument may be part of a broader Trump world strategy to elevate RFK Jr. among liberal voters by raising his profile on the issues they care about the most. According to the New York Times, allies of Donald J. Trump plan to promote Robert F. Kennedy Jr. as a champion for choice to give voters for whom abortion is a top issue and who also don't like Mr. Biden another option on the ballot. Trump allies also plan to amplify the progressive environmental records of Mr. Kennedy. Now, for the record, RFK Jr. has done nothing to suggest he would be an ideal candidate for people concerned about climate change and abortion. In fact, RFK Jr., is so far the only candidate in this race who has openly endorsed a national abortion ban. Here's what he told my colleague Ali Vitale on that subject late last year. I believe that a decision to abort a child should be up to the women during the first three months of life. So three months, you would sign a federal cap on that? Yes, I would. RFK Jr.'s campaign later tried to walk those comments back, claiming he misunderstood the question. But the video sort of speaks for itself. Since then, Kennedy has actually raised more questions about his commitment to reproductive freedom after he chose a running mate whose official abortion position is a word salad more than it is a coherent statement. Here it is. There are a number of extenuating circumstances that would lead me to considering terminating a pregnancy. This is a tweet from Nicole Shanahan. Those include my health, the health of the baby, and considerations of what happens to that baby if that baby is being born into a situation that cannot sustain a good and healthy life. In the consideration of economic, in the situation of economic consideration, I support bringing babies into the world through community support of both mother and baby. Huh? RFK Jr. isn't exactly a leading candidate when it comes to climate change either. One of the environmental nonprofits that Kennedy used to work for has endorsed Joe Biden, citing Biden's historic investments to fight climate change through the Inflation Reduction Act, a bill RFK Jr. says he would not have signed as president. Over the course of this campaign, Kennedy has really aligned himself with the right. I'm not going to take people's guns away. Anybody who tells you that they're going to be able to reduce gun violence through gun control at this point, um, I don't think is being realistic. You talk about solutions for the Palestinian people. The yeah. Palestinian people are arguably the most pampered people by international aid organizations in the history are you of the world. Me? No, I'm Even not. Dr. Fauci, he destroyed our schools, our churches, our businesses, and our economy. That is the platform that RFK Jr. is running on. But the facts may be beside the point here. Trump's allies are willing to do whatever they must in order to get Democrats to jump ship for Kennedy. And they are doing it in the open. This week, RFK's New York State field director was caught on camera saying this. The Kennedy voter and the Trump voter, the enemy, our mutual enemy is Biden. Whether you support Bobby or Trump, we all oppose Biden. 270 wins the election. If you don't get to 270, 
If nobody gets to 270, then Congress picks the president, right? Right now, we have a majority of Republicans in Congress. So who are they going to pick? Who are they going to pick if it's a Republican Congress? They'll pick Trump. The Kennedy campaign has tried to distance itself from those comments, but that doesn't mean the alliance between Kennedy and Trump world is weakening. As the New York Times notes, the Trump team's view is simple and is backed by public and private polling. The more candidates in the race, the better for Mr. Trump. The question is now, how do Democrats deal with this? Joining me now is Senator Tim Kaine, Democrat from the great state of Virginia, former chair of the Democratic National Committee and Hillary Clinton's former running mate in 2016. And also, as if he needed anything else on the resume, the author of a new book out this week called Walk, Ride, Paddle, A Life Outside. What is that? We're going to get to the, what is the outside? Senator Kaine, thank you for being here tonight. I am very eager to know what you you know what an election with spoilers is like. 2016 saw Gary Johnson and Jill Stein in the race. Um, some people think they took away from Hillary Clinton and her very, um, you know, well-documented margin of uh, victory in the popular vote, uh, but not in the Electoral College. What, what lessons should, did you learn from that and should Democrats take away from that as far as third-party spoilers? I'm glad you asked me that. I, I've always called myself an electoral college dropout since 2016, <laughs> winning the popular vote big, winning the Virginia vote that I've always won, but still falling short. And that just means that in 2024, we Democrats have to be focused on not just winning, but winning big. And I think we will, but we've got to deal with these spoilers who are really Donald Trump bootlickers. They are in this race, especially RFK, to help Donald Trump win. And we have to make that plain to American voters so they don't get bamboozled. Do you think when you talk about making a plan, I mean, if you look at the polling, right, in a five-way race, Trump beats Biden, RFK gets 13 percent of the vote. Uh, in a head-to-head -head matchup, Biden beats Trump. So if you're believing these polls, again, they're early and they're national polls. But, you know, RFK Jr. plays a yep. real role here in maybe handing this race to Trump. What exactly should Democrats do? Is it is it talking about RFK's record or is it exposing the allegiance that the Kennedy campaign apparently has to the Trump campaign? Yeah, no, I think you need to expose that RFK is a bootlicker for Donald Trump, not not just because his campaign team wants Trump to win and Biden to lose. But look at RFK's positions. I mean, good God, you know, he is a. Uh, um, been sympathetic to the January 6th rioters who tried to overturn a peaceful election and disrupt American democracy. Um, he is anti-science. He's for a national abortion ban. He's picked a running mate who is just cruelly against the 12 million people on the planet who have grown their families by in vitro fertilization. This guy is a Donald Trump bootlicker, and he's going to do everything he can to push it to Donald Trump. And I think when people really figure out the stakes, they will realize that uh, what a desperation signal it is for Donald Trump to say, wow, I don't think I can win votes myself. So can I prop up these Potemkin puppets and try to get people to vote for them? I think I think Virginia voters, that's the, I'm on the ballot in 24 and I'm worried about Virginia, but I think Virginia voters and American voters will figure that out. Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the app store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.